Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our ship talks um, here uh, uh, hosted by the International Maritime Museum of Hamburg. My name is Damien Moran, uh, and I work at the Museum on Online Communication. And today I have again the pleasure to speak with our friend Stephen Payne. Dr. Stephen Payne, a, a naval architect and, and great expert in everything that has to do with uh, passenger ships, but actually not only. And today it's a little bit of different editions, edition because we have been speaking a lot about, uh, so we have done several episodes about uh, ocean liners, but today we are going to speak about a battle cruiser, about the mighty hood. HMS Hood, uh, one of the uh, largest warships ever built, the largest in her time, uh, um, so when she was built. And um, because today, uh, today we are commemorating eight years from the Battle of Denmark Strait, and that is the moment uh, when uh, HMS Hood was sunk by the German battleship Bismarck. Uh, we will speak about the Bismarck II uh, um, uh, also very soon. There will be posts uh, uh, in the pages of the museum. Uh, but um, let's have a review about the meaning of HMS Hood, because it was by no means... So uh, lots of times the history of this ship is reduced to it being sunk by the Bismarck. But actually, uh, um, it was a very relevant ship in many aspects, uh, and it explains a very interesting aspect of uh, um, naval history. And uh, as I've heard for, uh, before from, from Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen would like to start making, so start before the construction of the hood, making a little bit of back history to the ship. And uh, so, hi, Stephen. First of all, sorry, I'm speaking without and then not even greeting you. So, uh, um, hi, Stephen. And uh, well, um, how did it? So, how did it came uh, to the construction of HMS Hood? Okay. Well, thank you, Damien, and hello, everybody. Very good to be with you once again. So the story of HMS Hood, um, great big battle cruiser. We really need to understand what the difference between a battle cruiser and a battleship is. So let, let's start in 1906, when the head of the Royal Navy, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Admiral Fisher, who was in charge of naval policy for Great Britain, he pushed through the design of a new battleship, which became known as HMS Dreadnought. And she was special because she was the first battleship to have all the main guns of one size. And you may say, well, why is that important? Well, before the Dreadnought, British battleships and many of the, of the foreign navies as well, they would have a mix of say 11 inch guns, nine inch guns, five inch guns. And what you have to remember is that in the days before radar and everything, the ranging of the guns was all done by firing a gun and then seeing where the shell splash was. That was the only way the gunnery experts on board the ships could determine where the, the, the shot was firing and whether or not they had to change the angle of the shot or decrease the range. And the big problem was that with 11 inch and nine inch and perhaps five inch guns on the same ship, all those guns produced shell splashes and they couldn't distinguish between them. And so they were unable to range the different guns quickly. And Fisher came up with the idea that if we have guns of all one size, wherever the shell splashes fall, we know that that was because of the, the main armament, the big gun, and therefore we can quickly alter the range and, and hopefully hit the target. So that, that was the first big thing with Dreadnought. So she was armed with 12 inch guns, but the other big thing to do with Dreadnought was her speed because British battleships and foreign Navy battleships at the time were running about 18 knots. 
but Fisher wanted a faster battleship. And at that time, the steam turbine had just been invented. And so as a very risky experiment, Fisher pushed through that turbines should be used on the dreadnought. And in fact, that was very successful because it increased her speed from 18 knots to 21 knots. Now, three knots of extra speed, you may not think is that dramatic, but in naval architecture and marine engineering terms, it certainly is. And we'll see a bit about that in a few minutes when we talk about other fast ships. But just that little bit of extra speed gives you a big tactical advantage because you can maneuver out of the way quicker, you can turn quicker and the like. So three knots may not sound like much, but it did have very big advantages. Now, Fisher wasn't content with the dreadnought. He had this vision of a much faster ship that would be able to intercept cruisers and other battleships, quickly do some damage and then run away fast. And this is the term where battle cruiser came about. And what it really is, is a battleship without any armor. So it's a lot lighter and all the weight that you save by not having the armor on board, you put into having more engines. So the British built a class of ship called the Invincibles. And they were comparable to the Dreadnought. They had a few less guns, but they were 12 inch gun, but they ran at 25 and a half knots. So much, much faster. But they had this Achilles heel that they were very um, under armored. So they didn't have much protection. And certainly in the Battle of Jutland, yeah. the big exchange between the German and the British fleets, three of the big British battle cruisers were sunk with, with huge loss of life. But let, let, let's park that part of the story there. Now, once the 12 inch gun had become established in the Royal Navy, again, with Fisher's drive and determination, he wanted more hitting power. So very, very quickly, the Navy, Royal Navy, went to a 13 and a half inch gun and then up to a 15 inch gun. So let, let, let's think about these, these shells and the guns for a moment. So the diameter of the shells went from 12 inches to 15 inches. So only three more inches. So what, what does that really mean to the, the power of the shell, the hitting power of the shell? Well, because you're increasing the, the length of the shell and the width of the shell and the height, it actually doubles the size of the shell. And what's amazing is that the 15 inch gun that was developed around the time of the First World War for the Royal Navy, each shell weighed 870 kilograms. So just under a tonne, each shell. And that shell had a range of 30,000 meters. And it left the gun barrel and flew through the air at 720 meters per second. And so at the maximum range, it would take 40 seconds after being fired out of the gun of the ship, 40 seconds before it would hit its target. So that's a tremendous distance. Yeah. And when you think this is all done before the days of computer, so it's mechanical um, computing devices that are working out what angle the gun has to be lifted up to get the range. But that absolutely crucial to all this, with such huge distances, if your ship where you have your gun is rolling about, you have to determine the exact split second to fire your gun. And then you have to estimate where your enemy is going to be in 40 seconds time for the shell from your gun to actually hit the enemy. Absolutely amazing. Um, and they were able to consistently 
hit targets. It, it is it is actually it is actually incredible when 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 you think about that. So uh, uh, the 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 ship had, as you just said, that is that there were no no real computers on board. So um, no. So uh, um, naval gunners uh, had to be what I am not very very good in mathematics. And well, that they they had. Um, what they call a ranging table, which was a mechanical computer with sailors that were trained to use it. So they would be fed all the things like the wind speed, because you think with the shell flying for 40 seconds, if there's a strong wind, it's going to be blown off. So you would turn dials on this machine for the wind and various other factors. And this mechanical device would tell you what angle to point the guns and also what elevation to, to lift the gun barrel. So absolutely um, tremendous there. And the, and the other thing with these 15 inch guns, they could fire two rounds a minute. So the guns fired every 30 seconds with a well-trained crew. Hmm. So, uh, is, uh, Stephen, uh, may, I, may I just just interrupt you for a, for a second? Uh, uh, sure. Since I'm since I'm in uh, I'm at home, and and um, I'm actually sitting beside my record collection, just to give okay. people people who may um, not uh, have an Im an image of of what's fifteen inches. I cannot show you what's fifteen inches, but actually, many of you will know this object. This this is twelve inches. So, okay. uh, um, so this is actually the 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 um, oh, it's um, disappearing a bit. This is the um, uh, 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 the, the diameter of one of the smaller of the, shell, of the smaller yeah. shells of the ones in the, in the dreadnought. Dreadnought, and if that's we are right. Thinking about fifteen inches, you will be adding adding something like this to the that's right. purple, more or less. So yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I just had this this idea because I have the records here and, and they, they oh, are very good. called 12 inches. So, yeah. all right. So, uh, excuse me for interrupting you. Uh, uh, no, no, no. So, we have the Dreadnought with a 12 inch guns steaming at 21 knots. We have the Invincibles with their 12 inch guns sailing at 25 and a half knots. The next big class of ship was the Queen Elizabeths, yeah. and they were designed to be a fast battleship squadron. There were five of them built during the First World War, and they had eight of the new 15-inch guns that we've just been talking about, and they could steam at 24 and a half knots, so three and a half knots faster than the Dreadnought, and one knot slower than the Invincible battle cruisers, but these were fully fledged battleships. They had all the armor protection, everything else, and they were very, very successful during the First World War, and they all served in the Second World War. Yeah. So very, very successful class, and the 15-inch gun that they had that we've been talking about is considered to be one of the best naval guns that the Royal Navy ever had. And certainly it compared very favorably with the, all the guns of the other navies at the time. Mm -hmm. But as you can imagine, Fisher was never one to be satisfied. So he'd got his Dreadnought, he'd got his Invincibles, he'd got his Queen Elizabeths. His next thing was to build a super Queen Elizabeth. And they were going to build four of them they were the hood class. And these were really very fast, super battle cruisers originally designed. And what Fisher wanted, he wanted a squadron of these ships that could steam 32 knots. All right. Okay. Now I've done a calculation and I just want to refer to my notes so I get it right, is that for a, a ship traveling 21 knots, if you push that ship to its limits to go 24 knots, so that's a 14 increase in speed, 14%, 14 
you need nearly 50% increase in the power. So you need another half engine room to provide that power. But if you go from 21 knots to 32 knots, which is a 52% increase in speed, you need nearly four times the power. So whatever engine room you had for the 21 knot ship, you needed nearly four times of that to drive it at 32 knots because it's not linear. It's a, a cubic function. Mm -hmm. and most of that power is wasted in creating waves because the waves create a huge resistance. Yeah. And that, that's why it's the, this, this cubic function. But first of all, you've got to find space in your ship for all this extra machinery. You've got to carry that machinery. So you've got to do a lot of different things. So the only way they could make the hood go at this tremendous speed was to make her a lot larger. So we have the Dreadnought at 21,000 tonnes. We have the Queen Elizabeth's at 34,000 tonnes, and the hood was about 47,000 tonnes, fully loaded. Hmm. And it was just at the time of Jutland when the three battle cruisers were sunk that they were laying down the hood on the slipway and they stopped the construction because they said, well, there's something obviously drastically wrong with battle cruisers if three of them have been sunk in this battle. And what they did, they had another look at the design of the hood and they added 5,000 tonnes of extra protection. Mm -hmm. So let's put that in perspective. 5,000 tonnes is the equivalent of five World War I destroyers or three World War II destroyers in weight. So you've got to imagine you've got this battleship or battle cruiser, and you're adding three to five other ships on top of it yeah. in weight to protect it. So the big thing was that the ship was a lot heavier than was she was originally designed. Mm. But nonetheless, they completed the hood, and she did her sea trials in 1921, and she reached her 32 knots speed and she was the most magnificent looking warship you could ever imagine and, and okay I, i'm british and <laughs> royal navy but <coughs> as i've shown throughout our talks mm -hmm. if something of another country is good i i will tell you but believe you me um hood was was really special with the long length and um, what what is she she's 200 and 62 metres long, weighs the 47,000 tonnes, so she's the largest warship in the world by a large margin. The two forward turrets, the two guns each, then a huge armoured control tower. Then you've got the tripod foremast with a large bridge structure embedded within it. Two evenly spaced and, and same size funnels. And then you've got a large boat deck. And then behind that, you've got the two aft turrets. So she looked a magnificent ship. A lot of the earlier ships had funnels of different sizes and they were um, intermittent. So you'd have two funnels close together and then a big gap. Nothing like that on Hood. She was perfectly symmetrical, absolutely beautiful ship. And because of that, being the largest warship in the world, flagship of the Royal Navy, she was chosen to do a lot of world tours mm -hmm. with the Royal family. She went completely around the world, went through the Panama Canal and did many, many trips. The big problem was because she was in such a demand for what we call showing the flag, mm -hmm. they were never able to really update her. Hmm. And so as the 1930s progressed and there's more tensions coming on, they were rebuilding the Queen Elizabeth class battleships. They even rebuilt some of the 
other battle cruisers like the Renown and the Repulse and the like, but they only did very small refits to Hood. And in fact, at the outbreak of war in 1939, Hood was in a rather poor state because her boilers really needed a complete overhaul. So all the tubes were leaking. So it was very difficult for her to maintain steam. She had a lot of leaks on her decks. And because she was so heavy, she sitting low in the water meant that it was often that the waves would crash over the front mm -hmm. and the back of the ship. It was often the stern of the ship was actually under the water a lot of the time. Yeah. But because of the um, leaks, that water would come down inside the ship and a lot of the electrical systems would fail because as we all know, electricity and seawater particularly don't mix, causes fuses <coughs> to blow. And so she had a lot of problems. Um, may, I, may I make a, a comparison that I think you are going to like, you, you being quite in love with, with HMS Hood. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's a quite far-fetched comparison, but uh, HMS Hood had the same problem that uh, 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 Da Vinci's Mona Lisa has. Um, do, do, I don't know if, if you have ever heard of that, but because it's the picture everybody wants to see when they go to, to the Louvre in yeah. Paris, um, uh, the Louvre is somehow not allowed to take it out of exhibition for a couple of months to, to make a much needed uh, uh, conservation and restoration of the painting, which is actually in a very poor state, uh, even if, they, well, they, 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 they have incredible security measures to keep the, the pictures fit, but they it should really, really be restored, but they don't dare to do it. So actually uh, one could say that this showing the flag activities uh, in the interwar periods of the hood was uh, a little bit um, uh, the same thing. So they needed- Exactly the same to yeah. show the flag and um, yeah it's it's kind of it's it's kind of interesting so so the ship arrived in a in a rather poor condition when world war 2 was declared yes yeah they they were able to change some of the secondary armament and modernize that a little bit but um, very little was done to the machinery and as I say, she was plagued by all these um, electrical failures that would, e even to the point that suddenly the, the main turrets would stop working and things like that. So it was amongst this background that she entered the Second World War. She was used in the Mediterranean and home waters. And in fact, one of the sad things, she was part of the fleet that was sent down into the Mediterranean to attack the French fleet that yeah. was laid up um, because um, they wouldn't join the Royal Navy. Hmm. Um, and we can talk about that another time. <laughs> that, that's a fascinating story uh, um, uh, that is also quite good represented in the, so we, we have a couple of models uh, uh, of, the, of the Marine Nationale in World War II. And it's a very interesting story. What, what happened with, with France, France. It's, yeah. uh, um, it's quite fascinating. Uh, uh, how it uh, actually how France ended up being part of the of the Alice after the surrender uh, and and not part of the Exodus, which yeah. it, it well it's 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 really a story for another time because <laughs> we could speak quite a lot about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so we have the Second World War, and of course during the build up to the Second World War, the new German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, was building up. And part of their program was for a, a fleet of new cruisers. And then you had the pocket battleships of the Deutschland class, the Deutschland, Admiral Scheer and Graf Spee, followed by two battle cruisers, the Scharnhorst and the Neisnau, and some heavy cruisers, Admiral Hipper and the Prinz Eugen and the like. And then two large battleships building in Germany. You've got the Bismarck and you've got the Tirpitz. Well, the Bismarck was nearing completion in early 1941. And by May of that year, she was ready for her first sortie. And it was originally decided that she would sail out with Scharnhorst and Neisenau 
and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, and that as a fleet, they would go out into the Atlantic and harass the, the British convoys coming over, bringing food and the like to, the, to Great Britain. In the event, the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower were held up in Brest and they were being refitted. So it was Bismarck and Prince Eugen that left um, German waters on the 18th of May, 1941. And they steamed out into the Baltic. They were spotted by a Swedish cruiser, the Gotland. And of course, Sweden was neutral at the time. And they reported that they had seen these two large German units sailing through the Baltic. And that immediately alerted the British that um, the Bismarck was at sea. She then went to Bergen, where she refueled. And the British sent over a long range reconnaissance Spitfire. And she was actually photographed at anchor in the field there at um, Bergen. And then when they went um, the following day with another plane, they discovered that she had gone. And the big issue then was that what route would she take to go out into the Atlantic? Would she go directly south and try and go through the English Channel? And that, of course, would be very risky. Would she go to the right-hand side of Iceland, between Iceland and, and Scotland, and sail down that way? Or would she go to the, the west side of Iceland? And that's, in fact, what, what she did. But Britain, realising that she had to go somewhere, they stationed cruisers out in various points in the hope that one of these cruisers was actually fine Bismarck and Prinz Eugen. And it was two British cruisers off the coast of Iceland to the west, the Suffolk and the Norfolk. And luckily they were the amongst the first ships to have a radar installation. Mm -hmm. So they discovered Bismarck and Prinz Eugen on radar, started shadowing the German ships. When they got too close, Bismarck and Prinz Eugen opened fire but they were quite happy to leave them in the distance. They, they didn't turn around and fight. And then, of course, the, the cruisers alerted the Admiralty in London and the Admiralty sent the Hood and the battleship uh, Prince of Wales that was just nearing completion. And she actually left the shipyard, still with shipyard workers on board. Oh. completing the fitting out of the ship. Mm. So they actually sailed with the ship into battle. Um, yeah, very interesting story. Probably not that funny for the for the uh, shipyard workers to be sent. No, I, th I think they were rather upset. <laughs> I would believe that, but uh, um, <laughs> all right. Didn't you the story? Very yeah. interesting. And then on the early morning, so a few minutes to six in the early morning, of the 24th of May, 80 years ago today, um, Bismarck and Prinz Eugen were sighted and the British ships raised their battle ensigns and tried to get in very quickly to engage with the German ships. Now, what we have to remember about this, this battle is that, as I've said, those 15-inch guns and the, the Bismarck had similar 15 inch guns. So, sorry, people, we were interrupted for a second here, um, but uh, 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 now we can go on. Uh, where were you, Stephen? We, the, 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 uh, well, we, we have the yeah. Hood and the Prince of Wales rushing in to approach the Prince Eugen and the Bismarck. <laughs> But what we have to remember, she had guns very much like the hood, the 15 inch guns. Mm -hmm. Prince Eugen had 18, no, eight inch guns, rather, somewhat smaller. But the important thing to remember here is that with the range, with that 30,000 meters, the shells didn't go straight sideways. They had to be pointed up and do an arc. So the most dangerous part for a ship wasn't the side of the ship because the shells wouldn't be coming in at the side. 
they would be coming in above and they would hit the decks. Yeah. So it was the decks that was the vulnerable thing. And the Admiral, Admiral Holland on the hood, realised that he had to get in very, very quickly and close the range in order to prevent what we call plunging fire, this where the shells are coming down on top of the deck. So he raced in at very high speed, but that meant only his forward guns could aim at the, the enemy ships, whereas the Bismarck and the Prinz Eugen, they could fire all their guns at the ships. So the exchange of fire started about five minutes to six. And as we've spoken about gunnery and how difficult it would be to hit, unbelievably, all the ships started more or less hitting each other very quickly. They found the range. Prinz Eugen hit the hood just behind the second funnel. And there was a large fire from all the ammunition that was stored on the deck for the anti-aircraft guns and things like that. So that started a big fire. The Bismarck fired at um, the Prince of Wales, damaged her bridge, and they had to um, steer the ship from the auxiliary position because the bridge was, was knocked out. But within a few minutes, Bismarck found Hood's range and a shell pierced the deck of the Hood at the aft part of the ship and the aft magazine exploded. And there was an enormous explosion. And then the hood started to sink. The Prince of Wales had to maneuver out of the way of the wreckage of the hood. And as hood was sinking, there was a second explosion. So the forward magazine then blew up. Mm. And all this happened within three minutes. So from the fatal hit to everything disappearing, it was less than three minutes. And 1,418 sailors lost their lives. There were only three survivors from the hood, and they were sailors that were up on the top on the um, spotting area, the lookouts. They were able to get off, and they were subsequently picked up by um, some of the other ships that approached the area later. But you can imagine that the pride of the Royal Navy, the ship that was still the largest warship in the world, and that within three minutes had totally disappeared. And certainly it was absolutely devastating for the British at that time in the war. The um, submarine threat on the North Atlantic was really hitting Britain hard. And then to get the news that the British flagship had sunk. And of course, that led Winston Churchill to give his famous command to the Royal Navy, sink the Bismarck. So whatever cost, he said, we would have to sink the ship. And of course, there was then a, a chase to keep in contact with Bismarck as she set out into the Atlantic. She was also slightly damaged in, in the battle. A shell had hit her forward fuel tank, so she started to lose fuel. And unbelievably, the, the, the British and the Germans lost contact with each other. So there was a good chance Bismarck and Prince Eugen would, would escape. But then for some inexplicable reason, Bismarck started transmitting signals to Germany and they were picked up by the British and by triangulation of the signals, they were able to find out the position. And then of course, the, the whole story of the Bismarck chase after that, sending off the swordfish bombers from the Ark Royal, damaging the Bismarck steering and then her eventual sinking off, um, off the coast of Brest, some 470 miles off Brest. But a tremendous story that ended um, on the um, 27th of May. Yes. So three days after Bismarck sunk the, the hood, Bismarck herself was sunk. But um, Prince Eugen was able to escape and she ended up going to Brest. And then, in fact, she was one of the few of the large German ships to survive the Second World War. Yeah. And she was uh, expended as a target 
in one of the um, American atomic bomb tests, and her wreck is still um, visible upside down in a lagoon in the, in the Pacific. So, um, but Hood had a charmed life for, for all her time, except, as I say, when, when she encountered um, the Bismarck. But many people say it was her design because she was originally battle cruiser. In fact, her standard of protection after the extra 5,000 tons was, out, was added was comparable to a, a, a battleship at the time. But it was purely the fact that she hadn't been refitted, and rebuilt, that um, she, she wasn't really fit to, uh, to take on Bismarck. Okay. Yeah. We, well, there. I, I'm seeing. I'm seeing a quite a, a quite uh, um, a lively exchange in the in the comment section uh, under this video. In in all the channels we are going to post it. This is always a, a subject <laughs> that uh, actually we we have. Uh, I have to to admit, and this is actually solely my my fault. Uh, um, I've uh, focused. I, I've spoken about this. His, this story quite a lot, but uh, I've uh, tend to focus more on the Bismarck, despite the fact that we have uh, uh, um, quite a lot of documentation and um, also amazing models on the hood. You, you are seeing this background. This is, by the way, um, <clears throat> this is a build by by amazing model, the amazing model maker uh, Wolfgang Wurm from uh, um, Austria, a uh, good friend of the museum, uh, and uh, this, the model is actually alone. Uh, uh, not alone, but alone. Uh, sorry for my English. Um, at, the, <laughs> uh, um, at the museum right now, um, and um, it's a, it's a great piece. So so the the story of the the hood is actually very interesting, and I, I'm, I actually wanted to 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 also to mention something that I picked up from from what you just uh, uh, explained in a very detailed way uh, regarding the. Um, uh, um, regarding uh, this um, this aspect of the morale and the war propaganda, and how can you use the how how the the losing a ship like the Hood uh, uh, is a great hit for uh, for a psych psychological hit uh, um, yeah. was it, it was for the British. Actually, you you spoke before about the the uh, the Deutschland class. Uh, um, uh, actually, it was the, the name was changed because there was this idea and um, it was not the first time it was, uh, it had been, um, uh, it had, it, it was a subject, but it, it was actually changed because they thought it's bad to lose a warship, uh, it's bad for the morale, but if this warship is called like the country, yes, so you, you, you could only imagine if the Royal Navy uh, 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 sank the, the ship called Deutschland, called Germany, uh, uh, you, you can imagine what would have appeared in the papers in in uh, um, in Great Britain the next day. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely. So <laughs> so they changed the name to Lutso, didn't they? Lutso. Lutso. Yeah, yeah. We, we we did the same with the passenger ship Queen Elizabeth II in the Falklands because she oh. was sent down to be a troop ship, but she didn't actually go to the Falklands itself. She went to South Georgia which is a, a far distance from the, the Falklands. And there she unloaded her troops onto other ships, including the Canberra. Now the Canberra was, was white painted, yellow funnels mm -hmm. stuck out. You know, you could easily spot the Canberra, but they were happy to send her into the Falklands. You know, it would have been terrible, of course, had she been hit and sunk. Yeah. But they weren't willing to expose the QE2 to that risk because of the name of the ship and the association with the queen of the, of the country. Of so course. exactly the same, you know, sort of um, reasoning. It's actually a thing that, well, the, 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 it was also maybe the reason why so much effort was put to, to sink the Bismarck fast. Just to, yeah. to just to to, to make uh, a point. Even if it was not that, it's actually a, um, a quite an, an interesting subject. Uh, uh, battleships and, and even battle cruisers were in the were in the in the eve of World War Two. They 
even if if navies were still building them and were still uh, um, uh, uh, using them, uh, from a strategic point of view, they were a thing of the past. Because you, right. you 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 have the you have submarine warfare. You have submarines becoming um, like this this kind of di diving torpedo boats that you used to have before yeah. were becoming real submarines. And by, by the end of World War II, you really right. have yes. the real modern submarine, which is a, a, a which is nowadays still a, a very important naval weapon. And and especially you have naval air aircraft. Yeah, and absolutely. Naval aircraft aircraft was the uh, there is this, to put it in a, in a provocative and a little bit simplistic way, uh, um, the Bismarck was uh, uh, put no out. Anachronism. Yeah, she, uh, she was... She was put out by, by, by planes built of wood and, and fabric. That's right. That's and right. and one of these this, this little planes, you can, you can build a Spitfire in a couple of hours. And and well, building building something like the Hood or or uh, the Bismarck uh, is a very different story. It's you need a, yes. Yes. a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of resources. That's right. So, um, and of course, uh, she was followed by her sister ship, the Tirpitz, and Tirpitz was never used out in the Atlantic, hmm. but. She, a lot of people say, well, she, she didn't do much during the war. Well, perhaps she didn't, but she was sent up to Norway. And because of the convoy routes from the UK and America up to Russia, she was always a constant threat to those convoys. So just being there meant that the Royal Navy and the different air forces had to keep a lot of planes, a lot of ships, tied up just in case the Tirpitz went out to sea. Even if she never did, it still meant a lot of the resources mm -hmm. of the allies that could have been used elsewhere were tied up keeping, um, you know, Tirpitz um, under bay. So uh, this is... it was a very um, good way of using the ship but not exposing it to danger. Uh, it is It is actually, um, uh, we, uh, I, there was recently on the on the uh, on the social media channels of the museum on Instagram and Facebook. There was quite. I, I posted a picture of, of the the construction of the Tirpitz. There was a very nice diorama on it uh, at the museum, and uh, there was a lot of discussion. And many people say, "Well, she was kind of wasted." But actually, what I what I've heard from uh, uh, from all naval historians, uh, uh, they are respect the most is that uh, if you compare the the, the service. Of the of the Bismarck and that of the Tirpitz, the Tirpitz was much more useful and used in a very and a much more intelli in, in intelligent way, That's um, right. strategically and uh, in a in a quite brutal and, and simplistic way. Again, uh, um, one could even say that that uh, um, uh, that the Bismarck uh, went in a more or less suicide mission. Yes, she caused a lot of trouble trouble for a short time she may have sank the hood but uh, uh but as as story tells us that was also not by no means what does what was that uh, uh, the end for the royal navy no and, and as you say the, the the rise of the aircraft and the other big thing that contributed to that was radar yes um because that the Norfolk and the Suffolk having those early radar sets, they were able to spot the Bismarck and that long before the Bismarck knew that the cruisers were there. Yeah. So um, yeah, with, with all that um, modern technology. Um, but you just the, the the final big gun um, engagement between the Royal Navy and the German Navy was at the end of 1943. Mm -hmm. December 19, no, yeah, December um, the 26th, 1943, the Battle of North Cape, mm -hmm. when the Royal Navy and the Scharnhorst were yeah. engaged in battle, and Scharnhorst was sunk. And one of the ships that um, was there in the battle and, and contributed a lot was HMS Belfast, which is the preserved cruiser in, in the um, on the Thames in London.
Uh, it's a, it's a must see for anyone who is in London. It's it's a, it's an amazing museum ship, and uh, I've had the pleasure to be on deck, and I can really recommend it. It's <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, oh, one, one last thing I wanted to 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 say about the it's it's very it's the thing about linguistics. Um, uh, uh, in English, you speak about the battle of Denmark Strait, for example. You you call it a battle. It is yeah. very interesting because uh, um, in German. Um, it is not called the battle. It is called so the 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 word battle in German is uh, Schlacht. So you have, for example, the Battle of Jutland in German has the very easy to pronounce name Skagerrachtschlacht. Uh, so for for non German speaking, it's, it's a yes. Um, but uh, but the um, but we, we don't say uh, um, we don't say. Uh, Schlacht for the Battle of, of uh, the Strait of, of the Denmark Strait, we say um, Gefecht, which is um, which is a smaller term than a battle. So uh, if, if you will sp you will speak about a naval battle if if really two fleets meet each other, like like it was in Skarak. If it's if it's less, so there is this this kind. It's not. You you have the word the word skirmish in English, but skirmish, yeah, and the other word we have, which you sometimes use, is engagement. Engagement, okay. I was just just trying to find a word in. I was thinking about the word combat, maybe, or but engagement would be maybe the the, the nearest translation, and and uh, uh, well, I mean, it's it's not uh, everybody knows what what is meant with it, so it's not really yeah. a big big problem. But it's it's kind of interesting to. To see that uh, um, uh, that so, so for example also uh, um, uh, Germans uh, called Berg which is mountain uh, 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 things that in in other countries you so especially in the central area of, of Germany which has very little mountains um, uh, uh, they call it mountains to things that for example in Spain you will call a, 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 a Mount, a, hill or, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. A, a larger hill. You will have another word for it. So it's yeah. it's, um, it's an interesting thing. But well, Stephen. Uh, um, so we, we we are kind of <laughs> going other places. So it's, it's a thing I, I do quite a lot myself. So I apologize if if I'm boring someone. But um, well, we, thank you very much for for this uh, uh, for this. No, it's a very special day to yeah. be able to commemorate. Um, 80 years since all that happened years, yes. and, you know I, I was born in 1960 mm -hmm. so 15 years before or after rather the the second world war and when you think 15 years is it, it, just a blink so it makes me you know very conscious that I was almost there at, at that sort of time at the conflict so um yeah, no, I think it's very important that we not only remember those um, fallen on both the British and the German side and that, but uh, and um, programs and discussions like this, um, you know, I think it is very good and very important. So, and I, I certainly look forward to seeing all the comments and uh, maybe um, saying a few things in, in there as well. You are you are always welcome to comment as well. I will be. They're commenting, and I will probably have to to um, uh, to learn a lot myself on the matter to, to uh, find answers and 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 uh, send quite a lot of emails uh, uh, to colleagues that know better about uh, uh, naval history than I do. Um, but yeah, so so thank you very much for this. We are going also to to do um, so in in um, uh, on the twenty seventh we. If everything goes well, we plan to release um, not a video this time for uh, technical reasons, but a, a larger article on the on the Bismarck, uh, focusing on the Bismarck also for the 80 years of first thinking. Yes. Um, so uh, so this is, this video is kind of, is going to be kind of the the part one, and there will be the part two. So you are welcome to to read that as well. It will be on the website, on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, the video would also be on YouTube, of course, which you can, by the way, uh, uh, I'm supposed to say this, uh, uh, you can um, uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, we will try to post as regularly as it is possible to us. And of course, you can follow our page on Facebook and our Instagram account for regular 
uh, uh, some ship stories that we that we post there. So thank you very much to all of you for watching, to, for, to you, Stephen, to be again with us today. And uh, we will uh, be actually back with another video uh, as soon as we can uh, work on it. It's going to be a little bit less about war, also a little bit about war, but less. It's going to be, uh, again, an ocean liner. So um, have a nice day, everybody, and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.